Yes, yeah, so uh, when Guru Maharaj finishes, um, um, you know, uh, words, then you can uh, switch off, uh, switch on your camera. And at least when you're asking the questions that time, at least you can switch on your cameras. And uh, um, we can start now. So uh, the, from last uh, two, three days, Guru Maharaj has started the Madhurila chapter 22. And uh, he's been talking about um, uh, Krishna's different expansions uh, uh, in the material and the spiritual world. Uh, so uh, Guru Maharaj will continue from, uh, I'll share my screen quickly. Uh, Guru Maharaj will be covering today, Chaitanya Charismita, chapter 22, verse 10. Is that correct, Guru Maharaj, verse 10? Um, yeah. Okay. I'll go on mute. Okay. Uh, this particular chapter at the very beginning has the different uh, expansions and incarnations of the Lord, which is a carryover from the previous chapter. Um, soon the, the topic will switch to pure devotional service. And that's why I chose this particular um, chapter to deal with the intricacies of pure devotional service. But here, um, this beginning part is covering another category. So, but it's also interesting and very much uh, important to have this knowledge too. Okay, we can begin. Sri Madhulila, chapter 22. Verse number 10, Sri Vivinansa Jiva Duita Prakara Eka Nitya Mukta Eka Nitya Samsara Se Vivinansa Jiva Duita Prakara Eka Nitya Mukta Eka Nitya Nitya Samsara The living entities, jivas, are divided into two categories. Some are eternally liberated and others are eternally conditioned. Next verse. Nitya Mukta Nitya Krishna Charana Numuka Krishna Parisada Nama Bujide Seva Sukha. Those who are eternally liberated are always awake to Krishna consciousness and they render transcendental loving service at the feet of, the, of Lord Krishna. They would be considered eternal associates of Krishna and they are eternally enjoying transcendental bliss of serving Krishna. Nitya Bhada Krishna Hoite Nitya Bahya Mukha Nitya Samsara Bhujay Narakari Dukkha Apart from the ever liberated devotees, there are the conditioned souls who always turn away from the service of the Lord. They are perpetually conditioned in the material world and are subjected to the material tribulations brought about by different bodily forms of hellish conditions. Say dosa maya pisachi dandakara tara ayatmi kakadi devtapa draya tara jara mara Due to his being opposed to Krishna consciousness, the conditioned soul is punished by the witch of the external energy maya. He is thus ready to suffer the threefold miseries, miseries brought about by the body and mind, the inimical behavior of other living entities, and natural disturbances caused by demigods. Kama Krula Dasa Hoye Tara Lata Kaya Brahmati Brahmati Yare Saru Vaidya Paya Tanvarupa Upadashe Matre Isachi Palaya Krishna Bhakti Paye Tabe Krishna Nakikata Raya In this way, the conditioned soul becomes the servant of lusty desires. And when, and when these are not fulfilled, he becomes a servant of anger and continues to be kicked by the external energy, Maya. Wandering and wandering throughout the universe, he may, get a, he may by chance get the association of a devotee physician whose instructions of him make the witch of the external energy flee. Conditioned soul thus gets in touch with the devotional service. Lord Krishna, and in this way he can approach nearer and nearer 
to the Lord, to the Prabhupada's purport. An explanation of verses 8 through 15 is given by Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kaur and his Amrita Pravaha Basya. The Lord is spread throughout the creation in his quadruple expansions and incarnations. Krishna is fully represented with all potencies in each and every personal extension. But the living entity, although separate expansions, are also considered one of the Lord's energies. The living entities are divided into two categories, eternally liberated and the eternally conditioned. Those who are ever liberated never come in contact with Maya, the external energy. The ever conditioned souls are always under the clutches of the external energy. This is described by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Daiviyesha Gunamayi Mama Maya Dara Yaya. Krishna says this divine energy of mind, consisting of the three modes of material na nature, is difficult to overcome. The Nitya Bhadas are always conditioned by the external energy. And the Nitya Muktas never come in contact with the external energy. Sometimes an ever liberated personal associate of the Supreme Personality of God it descends into this universe just as the Lord descends. Although working for the liberation of conditioned souls, the messenger of the Supreme Lord remains untouched by by the material energy. Generally, ever liberated persons now these live in the spiritual world as associates of Lord Krishna. And they are known as Krishna Parishada, associates of the Lord. Their only business is enjoying Lord Krishna's company. And even though such eternally liberated persons come within this material world to serve the Lord's purpose, they enjoy Lord Krishna's company without stoppage. <clears throat> The ever liberated person who works on Krishna's behalf enjoys Lord Krishna's company through his engagement. The ever conditioned soul provoked by lusty desires to enjoy the material world is forced to transfer migrate from one body to another. Sometimes he's elevated to higher planetary systems. Sometimes he's degraded to hellish planets and subjected to the tribulations of the external energy. Due to being conditioned by the external energy, the conditioned soul within this material world gets two kinds of body, a gross material body and a subtle material body composed of mind, intelligence, and ego. Due to the gross and subtle bodies, he's subjected to the threefold mysteries, Adhyatmika, Adhivautika, Adhidaivika miseries arising from the body and mind and other living entities and natural disturbances caused by demigods from the higher planetary systems. The conditioned soul subjected to the threefold material miseries is ceaselessly kicked by Maya. And this is his disease. By chance, he meets a saintly person who works on Krishna's behalf to deliver the conditioned souls and if he agrees to abide by his order, he can gradually approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Omigyan timidam dasya gina jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri guravena maha ma om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri makti bhaktivedanta swami iti namit Namaste, Saraswati Dede, Gauravani, Pachari, Nene, Vrsi, Sasunya, Vali, Pastyat, Yade, Satari, Panchakopa, Tarubis, Chakripa, Sindhu, Pe, Pachapatitanam, Bhavane, Vyo, Vaishnava, Vyo, Nama, Nama, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadhar, Sri Vasudhi, Gaur, Bhaktavindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, we're hearing about the living entities in two categories. 
One is Nitya Bhada and the other one is Nitya Siddha. Nitya Siddha means eternally liberated. Nitya Bhada means eternally conditioned. Uh, we'll explain those terminologies because they, re they require some type of explanation. Nitya Siddhas or Nitya Muktas, either one, we call them both, are those living entities who never leave the spiritual world. They never come to the material realm. They are always with the Lord in the spiritual realm eternally. They never fall. And uh, this makes up the majority of the jivas, or the living entities. The small minority is us, the ones who have come to this material world in order to try to find some happiness, or maybe we came because we were curious to see what this material world is about. Or we came, as Prabhupada said, because we had a problem with Krishna being the center. And we also felt we should get some center. So uh, never really clear how we fall. As Prabhupada said, when you go back, you'll know everything. So then he encouraged us that go back and then you'll know everything. And because this is one particular principle that is very difficult to hypothesize how we fall into the material world. But obviously it's due to the wrong type of consciousness. And how does that wrong consciousness arise in the spiritual world? That is the question that is uh, never fully answered. Uh, all we can say is that the living entity has independence and the misuse of that independence allows one to choose which, where they're gonna be and how they're gonna act. Of course, it's hard to conceive, impossible to conceive, we might say, how being in such a pure atmosphere, one would somehow develop the wrong consciousness. But the possibility is there. We see how even Lord Brahma became uh, bewildered by Krishna and thought Krishna was an ordinary person. Although he was a devotee of Krishna, somehow or other, and being in a very powerful position in the material world, the most powerful, he somehow used his independence to try to outsmart Krishna by stealing his calves and cowherd boys. Of course, of course that wasn't possible because Krishna is the all-knowing Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he understands exactly how everyone is acting at every minute if he wants to. He has that uh, ability to understand everything in every part of his creation and beyond. And so um, this uh, unsolved mystery of how we came to the material world really has not so much importance. What's really important is how to get back out get back to our natural, spiritual, constitutional position of eternal associate, so totally, attorney associating with the Supreme Personality of Godhead in loving devotional service. So us, those who have come to the material world, we are called Nitya Bhadas. Uh, Bhada means conditioned, and Nitya means eternally. And the term is used here in describing that it's the eternally conditioned. Now, you might question how that is labeled. If we were in the spiritual world at one time, and now we fell to the material world, how can we be eternally conditioned? That means 
we were conditioned at a certain time, but not eternally. Um, the question or the answer actually comes in the form of a understanding of a principle. What is that principle? That um, one has been in the material world, especially those who, particularly those who have reached the human form of life. One, uh, the living entity in a particular situation has traversed life after life and so many different species of life. We've gone through most of the 8,400,000 species until we can come to the civilized form of human life. Civilized means one who has higher intelligence to discriminate between um, what is one's self-interest and what is not. There are also uh, living entities categorized as humans who are somewhat subhuman. Uh, they don't have much intelligence. They live in the jungles and they're pretty much like animals in the way they live, but they have a human form. And they're on, they're on many different planets like that. So, but when one comes to a intelligent form of human life, and of course it says if one takes birth in the land of India, then one has shown to be pious for many lives and has somehow gained the privilege of taking birth in the holy land, which allows one to make fast progress in that, in, in that life and go back to Godhead. But the word again, eternally conditioned means that uh, one is so long in the material world there's no way they can trace out their existence in the material world. It's not possible. So the word eternally conditioned simply illustrates or uh, indicates that uh, we've been in this material world so long that it appears that we are eternally conditioned. That's, that's a certain terminology that requires some explanation. Uh, so here we are in the material world <laughs> and uh, the idea is how to get out. <laughs> there are those who don't want to get out, who want to stay in the material world, who think that by adjusting the material energy, they can find some satisfaction, some happiness, some fulfillment, and they work in that way. And gradually, they come to learn through their experiences in life that they cannot control the material energy, nor can they enjoy it. Uh, that usually comes with experience. But generally, those who have good intelligence and can accept the Shastras and the words of the spiritual master can uh, easily understand that this uh, conditioned nature can be eradicated very quickly through the path, pro process of pure devotional service. That is the power of pure devotional service like that. But in, we see here about the foolish living entities who are servants of their lusty desires uh, they're always overcome with qualities like, such as anger and lust, envy, and various other forms of material attachments that relegate one to the material energy. And so it's important to understand the, our position and that way we can somehow move away from that, our present anomaly, to take birth as an anomaly, to have a material body as an extension of that same anomaly, uh, to try to enjoy in this material world is a foolish attempt by the conditioned souls to try to create something that is not available.
So this is the conditioned soul. Now, if one takes full shelter of devotional service and engages in the activities of devotional service, specifically as mentioned here, under the guidance of a spiritual master, if one takes it very seriously and executes their service in that way, they develop a sense of attraction for the uh, Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then they can get free from that. So um, it is all based on uh, instructions and adherence and determination to serve the instructions of the, the guru and the, the Lord. Of course, the guru is the foremost because he's giving what the Lord desires to the living entities. But he is such a, a powerful personality that uh, simply by following his, his instructions, one receives the mercy of the Lord, which allows them two things. One, they get a taste for serving the Lord. They start to enjoy it. And they get, a, they get freedom from material attachments and material activities. Um, uh, mm, renunciation and knowledge automatically occur in the hearts of a conditioned soul who is engaged in devotional service. So these things happen by the power of one's devotional service. And the more one is absorbed in that, the more one is able to rise above the material energy. Okay, so we can go on to the next verse. Kamadina katena katida palita durni desa te samjatat maya na karuna trapa no pasanti usrij jatan atta yarupati sampratam lagya buddhis tvam ayatam sharanam avayam mamni niyuk swatma dasye. O oh my Lord, there is no limit to the unwanted orders of lusty de desires. Although I have rendered these desires so much service, they have not shown me any mercy. I have not been ashamed to serve them, nor have I even desired to give them up. O oh my Lord, O oh head of the Adar dynasty, recently, however, my intelligence has been awakened, and now I am giving them up due to transcendental intelligence, I now refuse to obey the unwanted orders of these desires. And now, and I now come to you to surrender myself at your fearless lotus feet. Kindly engage me in your personal service and save me. This verse is also quoted in the Bhakti Rasama to Sindhu. When we chant, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we are saying, oh, Hare, O oh, energy of the Lord, O oh, my Lord. In this way, we are simply addressing the Lord and his spiritual potency representatives as Radha Krishna, Sitaram, or Lakshmi Narayan. The devotee always prays to the Lord and his eternal consort so that he may engage in their transcendental loving service. When the conditioned soul attains his real spiritual energy and fully surrenders unto the Lord's lotus feet, he tries to engage in the Lord's service. This is the real constitutional position of the living entity. So here we find that uh, that uh, Prabhupada quotes that first line of that verse quite often, I and mean, he refers to the verse that's in the Bhakti Rasamatu Sindhu. There's no limit to the, the lusty desires I've had, and I've been serving them my whole life, and still they want more. They are never satisfied. So this is the nature of the material uh, desires. 
that the more you try to fulfill them, the more they become stronger and want more and more fulfillment. A person may mistakenly think, let me fulfill my desires and then that'll be it. No, but material desires work in such a way as that the living entity begins to develop an attraction and an attachment for fulfilling material desires one after another with no end in sight. And the tendency of material life is that the more you fulfill it, the stronger it gets. The less you try to fulfill your material desires, the more you can become connected to Krishna in devotional service to the Lord. And now here, this verse, he says, now I fearlessly, without any consideration, I simply take full devotion or full attention at your loving feet. Okay. So here, the last line is very significant. When the conditioned soul attains his real spiritual energy and fully surrenders to the Lord's lotus feet, he tries to engage in the Lord. This is the real constitutional position of a living entity. What does that mean? That means it's the perfection of life. Life, or the perfection or of fulfillment of all desires. We have desires, but we try to fulfill them one after another. But here is the position of perfection that one, when reaches one's constitutional position of loving service to the Supreme Lord, all of one's desires automatically become fulfilled simply by that attainment of that position. Why? Because that is our, our, our perfection. Uh, you'll see that um, hmm, what would be a good example I'm thinking. If um, one is engaged in various occupational activities and one uh, starts to find what is that occupational activity that is the one that I resonate the most with. And I act, in it, and I act in that way, then I make fast progress. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the main screen now, and uh, we can take questions. And now the bullies can turn on their cameras, and that will uh, inspire the speaker even more. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, uh, so, uh, is it okay if I give the quick summary of the uh, of the class, Guru Maharaj? Yeah, that's the, that's what yeah. should be done. Yeah. Uh, so Guru Maharaj started with um, uh, Chaitan Chaitamita Madhya Lila, uh, chapter 22, verse uh, 10. And uh, we started with um, a talk, uh, Guru Maharaj said uh, two things uh, uh, mentioned about the journey of uh, Nitya Padha to Nitya Siddha. And what are the Nitya Siddhas are? So Nitya Siddhas are eternally liberated. And it is Nitya Padha is eternally conditioned. Then Guru Maharaj explained the journey, how, uh, why we are conditioned in this material life. And um, how do we get back, basically? Basically, and uh, one main thing it was mentioned is uh, power of pure devotional service that uh, helps us uh, one go back to uh, Krishna, and that can be done only under the guidance of a spiritual master. And uh, how do we serve the spiritual master? Three things Guru Maharaj mentioned it was very important. 
uh, was that um, following his instructions, adherence and determination. And uh, that will free one from the material desires and uh, uh, one will enjoy serving Krishna. Uh, then the next word, verse 11, uh, 15 onwards was explained that uh, we have unlimited desires and uh, the more we try to fulfill them, the more it increases. Um, uh, so how do we you know, stay strong is that uh, the perfection of life is that we always serve Krishna and, and that we will be automatically that will fulfill our desires and you know and the reduction of the desires will start to happen. Uh, so I'm sorry if I have not uh, narrated it <laughs> properly, but uh, this was in the nutshell, I think Guru Maharaj has explained and, and apologies for any mistakes. Okay, very good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so devotees, uh, please, um, uh, um, you can ask your questions or uh, comments, realizations, or I can uh, type in the chat box and I'll read it for you. And please, um, if possible, try your camera on, try to keep your camera on, thank you. Okay. Right. Yes, Ashidevi Mataji, please go ahead. Thank you, Sadevama. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada, all glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Um, I'm listening to this lecture and I was thinking about the very last part where you said that the perfection of life is to fully surrender and then one is fully engaging in the Lord's devotional service and one attains the fulfillment of all desires. But I'm just thinking that once one fully surrenders, one doesn't have any desire for oneself. It is whatever is the Lord's desire, that's all that the devotee is interested in. So how, I don't get it that how do we obtain the fulfillment of all our desires? Well, all our, all our desires are, uh, for unlimited happiness, loving relationships, knowledge. Everything we try to fulfill in the material world in a roundabout way or in the material sense is just a reflection of our real desires in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. So they, they have no substance. So fulfillment of material desires means to go to a higher level of existence, that's all. Then these desires disappear. Mm. They okay. automatically disappear. We have okay. desire, but uh, when it's directed towards the material energy, it takes one, it entangles one in a network of struggle. But if we, uh, we have spiritual desire, and the spiritual desire is, to serve the Lord. And everything that comes with spiritual desire means perfection, happiness, unlimitedly, variety of activity, uh, uh, transcendental knowledge. These are all parts of the soul's nature. It's not something foreign to the soul. Once you become Krishna conscious, there's nothing else to attain. You obtain everything. Hmm. That's the perfection we're talking about. Yeah. And that is only when we have reached Krishna Prema. Is that right? Well, the goal of devotional service is loving service to the Lord. And loving service of the Lord is a gradual development of consciousness in, to that level of where the soul, as the, as the uh, verse mentions in the Chaitanya term, Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema, Saru Kabul Noi, Svavanadi Siddhi Chitte, Kodi Oyudoi. In the hearts of all living entity, pure love for Krishna exists. That is our birthright. Uh, and that love is natural, and it's our and it is our actual goal in life, although we may not be aware of it. Once we get a little sense of that, and then we start getting a taste for that, and then we try to increase it to its perfection. When it reaches perfection, then then there's no more existence in the material realm.
So yeah, if you have a million dollars, you have a hundred dollars. If you have Krishna conscious, you have everything. Hmm. Materially and spiritually. But of course, materially means that uh, a perverted reflection of the real desire. Because we, we, we try to fulfill that loving relationship in this world with other living entities. And we, we, we make these relationships through family and various other ways. But it does, it's not fulfilling. So that same fulfillment comes perfectionally when we when we find it in Krishna. Mm. And you also find it in your relationships with other living entities because Krishna is the source and connection connecting force between us and everything. Mm. Through Krishna, we connect with everything automatically. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, okay. I appreciate the explanation. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, love of God is, is the perfection stage. And love is not some sentiment. It's actually exhibited by uh, unalloyed devotional service. Okay, Raj, you have a question. Raj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Seth Raj. Uh, yes, my question is, if a conditioned soul reaches that stage of perfection, then is there still any risk of fall down? Uh, Krishna mentions that in the Bhagavad Gita. In the eighth, eighth chapter, having attained to perfectional stage, having once uh, gone back to the spiritual world, one does never again come back to this material world. Um, I think the verse is 815 in the Bhagavad Gita. And when Krishna explains, yeah, having, uh, Having attained perfection, one does it, never again falls down to this miserable material world of birth and death. So the example is given, once you stick your hand in the fire and you've been burnt by that fire, you have that awareness not to do it anymore. So uh, you, when you're back in the spiritual world, you have complete recollection. Recogli what's the word? Recollection. Recollection. One can remember <laughs> everything of one's existence in the material world. You remember all your lives and all your different species of life uh, in the material world. You have complete knowledge. So having that knowledge and remembering the experiences, you won't go back again. It's just foolish. You stick your hand in the fire, you get burnt, you're not gonna put your hand back in it again. But there is an, there is an element there that is you still have independence. But you won't, you, you won't fall down again. That's why Krishna says that. Once burnt, twice shy. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, she did. I just have another question, also, Guru Maharaj. So this stage of perfection, this uh, topmost stage of perfection, can it be attained in one lifetime? It can, because devotional service is not based on anything material. It can be attained in one lifetime, but generally it's rare. Prabhupada said generally it takes a minimum of two lifetimes 
or one will reach a certain level of perfection and go to where Krishna is in the material world to associate with him as he performs his pastimes in different universes. And then from there, one will reach the spiritual world after that birth. So that's Prabhupada's statement, and you can read it. But he's also said that it is possible to uh, achieve perfection in one life like that. It also depends on how conditioned you are and how much you, how eager you are for for attaining the uh, again your natural position of serving the Lord in His abode in the spiritual world. We should read about the spiritual world as mentioned in the Bhagavatam. It's also mentioned in the uh, and the Brihad Bhagavatam Gita gives you descriptions of the spiritual world. It's also there in Brahma Samhita. What is the spiritual world? What it's like? What are the activities of the residents of the spiritual world? So all of these helps to uh, awaken that desire to go back to the spiritual world. If you don't know anything about a place you want to go to, you don't have much desire to get there. <laughs> you might think, I don't like it here, but that's not good enough. You have to know where you want to go. Mm. And then again, you have to fulfill that, that requirement of getting there. Right, that's, that's the part that seems like, you know, so difficult because of all the purification that is needed to reach that point with all the material contamination, material attachment, material desires, which has been there for millions of lifetimes. It seems that, uh, you know, it's like almost impossible to, to get so purified as to reach that stage of perfection and go back to Krishna, it seems like next to impossible. Um, if it was impossible, then nobody would have been able to do it, but that's not true. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so it's doable, but um, the key, the big, the, there's many keys that can accelerate that. Well, the key is, uh, associate with and serve pure devotees. That's the fast track. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for telling us the fast track. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Arch in the city. I think you have a your yes, hand is high in the air. <laughs> Hare Krishna, <clears throat> Gurudev, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Gurudev, you said uh, love of God is the perfectional stage. And this love is natural. And we know that Krishna is all attractive. He is most opulent. <clears throat> uh, so why, why is it so hard to, um, to be attracted to, Krish to Krishna? Like we, we know all this, but... If I would have been so attracted to Krishna, I would have been up at three o'clock chanting. I would be chanting all day. Uh, and I would be so much better in my devotional service. So why is it so hard to get attracted to Krishna when he is all attractive? Because we're attracted to other things in this world. That's why. <laughs> We've divided our attraction. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason. But the more we um, focus our attention on Krishna, the more that attraction develops. Because Krishna, as you mentioned, Krishna is all attractive. That's why he's called Krishna. So there, there's different aspects of Krishna's attractive feature that is maybe more desirable by one living entity than, than another. So look for that part of Krishna that you find the most attractive mm -hmm. and then focus on that and then develop that more and more 
and that will become the force that will draw you in more. You know, there's some, Krishna's pastimes are very gatedness and there's a certain attractive element in all of them because Krishna is involved. But then again, his particular nature as the Supreme Lord is exhibited according to this particular pastimes that he's there. And so that nature, we also find, we get attracted to people in this world who have some of these qualities also. And then we want to associate with them and we want to maybe uh, try to imbibe some of those qualities ourselves. But Krishna has all good qualities in, uh, in full to the perfectional stage. But because we feel separated from Krishna and we think that separation is actually real. It's not, we're not, never separated from Krishna. He's always with us and we are always with him. But we turn our attention away towards other things and we give that priority. And that tends to uh, mitigate the time that we need to actually develop more and more attraction for Krishna. You know, as your attraction increases, so will, you, so will your absorption in Krishna increase. Sometimes we are, we are motivated by duty, our duties that we have in this world, and they sometimes become a little bit overwhelming or very time consuming. And that's probably one of the reasons, or maybe one of the main reasons why our attraction doesn't develop. It's just a time element. So it's nice to go on pilgrimage, go to holy places, you know, leave North Carolina for a while, go to, uh, <laughs> go to India and spend some time in Vrindavan or Mayapur during the festivals, associate directly with the spiritual energy and the Holy Dham. It kind of uh, accelerates our uh, happiness in Krishna consciousness and, and, and awakens more of our desire to become Krishna conscious. That's why that's also recommended as one of the important principles is to go to holy places, associate with personalities, and engage in devotional service there also. Hear from them. Uh, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. That helps a lot. That's one of the, that's one of the things that helps a lot. Hmm. And it's required. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given some instructions. Some appear to be more important than another. another. But one instruction he did give that mentioned is that um, the Acharya said one should visit all of the pastime places that Lord Chaitanya performed his activities in. Now, is that possible? <laughs> you might say it's impossible because you know, he went to thousands and tens and thousands of places to perform his pastimes. If we could just get a little drop of that. And the atmosphere of the Dom is a lot different than the atmosphere of North Carolina. <laughs> it tends to uplift you. <laughs> Whereas the upliftment in North Carolina means a lot of work you have to do <laughs> in order to create that environment you, where the dom does it for you. <laughs> so you see, it, it also we have to take some time to visit holy places. It's a very important part of our, our uh, development in Krishna consciousness. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Looking forward to visit India soon. And thank you so much. <laughs> but don't get don't don't get discouraged. <laughs> no, no, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Thanks, Shall I we, it in my bed. Mr. Brent? Brent has a question. Yes, mm -hmm. his hands was up, but I think it looks like he is log off. He just Maybe left that's... just before his yes. question. <laughs> Is he back yet? No. no, he isn't. I think maybe the internet connection at his place, maybe. Angur Maharaj. Raj Prabhu has his hands up. Raj Prabhu, yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Ji. Yes, Maharaj. I just wanted to understand this state of perfection a bit more because, as I understand it, some souls reach Krishna in his sweetest two armed form in Goloka Vrindavan. Whereas others may reach, others may have a mood of awe of reverence with maybe in his forearmed form and reach other Vikings planets. So when you were talking about that state of perfection, are you applying that to either and different? Uh, both, both, both are stages okay. of perfection. They're just a, so just a variety of how that that perfection manifests according to the uh, nature of the jiva. So some jivas have an eternal relationship with Krishna in Vaikuntha, others in the in Goloka. For instance, when Lord Chaitanya was performing his pastimes, Murari Gupta was one of his associates. Murari Gupta was an was an incarnation of Hanuman who appeared in Lord Chaitanya's pastime. And Lord Chaitanya tested Marari by teasing Marari to give up his attachment to Lord Ram and accept the attachment to Lord Krishna. Marari, wanting to obey Lord Chaitanya, made an attempt, but he wasn't able to do it. And he was, he was really in distress after seeing the Lord the next day. The Lord laughed <laughs> and said, I course you, I course you, uh, you couldn't do it. You are, you are, uh, uh, you're a Hanuman. And then he took uh, a piece of Gopi Chandan and he wrote on the forehead of Marari Gupta Ramdas. <laughs> So, yeah, so you see that there are certain living entities who are, who are fixed in their leelas, in, uh, in, in their position in uh, Vaikuntha and others in, in Goloka Vrindavan. Now, sometimes the question comes, can you change? Can you go from Vaikuntha to Vrindavan? The answer is yes. <laughs> But you may have to take another birth and in the material world and enter into the mood of Vrindavan, cultivate that consciousness of Vrindavan consciousness, reach perfection in that consciousness and realign your consciousness with Krishna and Vrindavan. That is possible also. But both are, both are perfectional stages. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for answering my second question as well. Mm. Okay. Um, is it okay if I ask one question, Guru Maharaj? Um, yeah. Just... Uh, when, a person, when a person finishes their question, make sure you take away their hand. Okay. Like Ajna Mataji. Still has her hand up. <laughs> okay. Do you have any other question, Arjuna Siddhi Oh, no, she, she doesn't. Okay. Thank you, Mataji. Okay. Uh, so, Guru Maharaj, um, one of the um, Shri Devi Mataji's question, uh, you said the key is um, uh, to uh, achieve perfection is um, uh, serving pure devotees and, you know, getting the association of pure devotees. And uh, I guess I think this is the, you know, most common question in ISKCON. It's, you know, asked that how do we how do we know and uh, what, how do we know who is pure devotee and what if we don't get the association of pure devotees and uh, where we are or maybe, uh, do we, sorry, yeah, you can ask. If, if somebody says, hands you 
a rock and said, this is gold, then how do you know it's gold? Because they have said it. Then you have to know how to test and see if there's gold. So there's a, t there's a test for understanding what is gold. Similarly, there's a test for understanding or there's a criteria for understanding what, well, who is a pure devotee. Hmm. Um, one is they're fully engaged in devotional service. Two, they're exhibiting the characteristics and qualities of the pure devotee. Three, they don't find fault with others. Either you have to look for certain characteristics. And when you see these characteristics, you can conclude accordingly. Um, but then again, getting advice from others to help confirm what you think, what you have already concluded. That would also, because sometimes there are certain characteristics about a pure devotee that seems to be a little uh, uh, unclear. It may look like something material, but it's not. For instance, Pundarik Vidyaniti. There's a good example. He was, uh, he was actually, you know, Radharani's father in, in uh, Krishna Leela. He was King Vrishabhanu. When he appeared in Gaur Leela, he appeared as a, a gross materialist in terms of his outward dress, the way he dressed, the way he lived. He was living very luxuriously. And it seems like he was somewhat uh, overly attached to his own uh, conception of himself. It wasn't until Gadadhar Pandit came on the request of Lord Chaitanya, and then with the help of Mukunda, uh, he was able to understand that this person is actually a pure devotee. But even he was bewildered when he first saw uh, Pundarik Vidyanidhi. So there are, there are situations where one cannot com completely conclude based on what, what appears to be something different. But generally, you can come to some understanding. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Any other questions, devotees? Nitai Nataraj is cooking up a storm there. <laughs> I hope you got enough for all of us here. <laughs> this cooking for you know, this uh, chapati and two sabjis. <laughs> okay, all right, keep going. Thank there's you. a lot of there's a lot of us out here. Yes, she did. You that you can go ahead. I just have to ask this question, please forgive me. Um, Guru Maharaj, I'm still hung up on this and I'm, I'm, I guess I, I am not understood. I know I've asked this question and you've answered it, but somehow it's just doesn't get into my dull head. Please forgive me. But we have this uh, uh, Damodar Ashtakam prayer. I do not pray to you for the boon of impersonal liberation, nor for the boon of liberation of life in Vaikuntha, nor any other boon, etc. But then when we say, I want to go back to Godhead, I want to go back to Krishna, I want to go back to the spiritual world, is that not asking Krishna for something for oneself rather than leaving it to Krishna to decide whether, you know, to take us back or not? Well, if you read the scriptures and you also listen to the Acharyas, especially Srila Prabhupada, who also quotes previous acharyas, you'll find that there is apparently some uh, different definition of that. One, it says that uh, very few living entities desire to go back home, back to Godhead. But if one does, and then one, then Krishna automatically recognizes that person. And it's considered to be perfection. But then again, other statements show that yes, because it's my, it's about me, it has, it's not to the highest perfection stage. So there's perfection and then there's more perfection. 
just like it says that the activities in Dwarka, uh, I'm sorry, the activities in Dwarka are perfect. The activities of Mathura are more perfect and the activities of Krishna and Vrindavan are most perfect. So you get perfect, more perfect and most perfect. They're all the word perfect is there in all three. So to go back home, back to Godhead or have that desire is perfect, but most perfect is to want to simply serve the Lord wherever the Lord places one. Mm. 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 So will one graduate from perfect to more perfect to most perfect if we keep going? Will we be able to purify ourselves more and more and more like that? No, you have to desire that also. What if my desire is, Krishna, just I want to come back and be with you? That's good enough. I'm <laughs> happy with that one. <laughs> Guru Maharaj, that's it. For me, there's no more. I'm not so uh, selfless. Oh, you put me in hellish planet. You put me here. Yeah, I just want to go back to Krishna. Finish. That's it. That's good enough. I'm happy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm stopping there. That's enough for me, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> You may, if you desire the other one, you may dis may you might not you might realize you're not able to come up to that that level of the surrender. This place is hellish enough for me. I don't need any more hellish planets. No, I mean, I mean Prabhupada talks about that, and uh, even Shiva, Lord Shiva, makes that one statement in the. Uh, Fourth canto, Narayana para sarve na kushchisna na vidyati. What is it? Sapa pavargya apana tuya artha. That the devotees of the Lord, wherever they are, they're fixed on the Lord. Whether it's in heaven or in hell, they're always engaged in devotional service to the Lord. The Lord, Lord Shiva gives that statement, which is a famous verse, that. Ultimately, the highest perfection is simply to want to serve the Lord wherever the Lord places one. That's all. Not that you'd simply, you'd, well, I'll do it because he asks me. No, you actually want that. This is my desire to simply fulfill his desire. That's all. But if you want to go back home, back to Godhead, how do you go? <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. That's a big relief. That, that's a legitimate desire. I was wondering whether that's also not okay. <laughs> I'm so confused. Well, then we'll say something else to make you more confused. And that is that we need preachers. So stay in the material world as long as you can and keep saving the conditioned souls. <laughs> Oh, Guru Maharaj, I am catching hold of your lotus feet to save me. Where's the question of saving anybody else? The, the Kali Yuga is there's really so many souls that need the mercy, and there's not enough persons to give them mercy. All right, Guru Maharaj, whatever you say. Yes. I gave you a choice. <laughs> okay, Guru Maharaj, thank you very much. My humble obeisances to you and my gratitude. Thank you, Shidavi Mataji. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, we, have, uh, we have gone past one hour, so I think if there is no other questions, then we can close. Yes, Guru okay. Oh, yeah, I have a... Uh a request for all the devotees who are listening online. It's, uh, there is one disciple, Prem Kishori. I'm sure you know her. She's a doctor in, uh, in America, Pennsylvania. She's engaged in preaching online and she has these curriculums that she has to develop for putting out these different programs of preaching centered around verses in the Bhagavad Gita and she has four different programs and she needs to develop a curriculum 
based on each one of these programs. And she's asking if there's anyone there who has the knowledge to help develop a curriculum. If anybody can have that, has that acumen, the ability to uh, put together a curriculum based on the information and, and that, that she has. And if you do, I'll just, you can just uh, contact Prem Kishori and she'll, uh, and she'll uh, fill you in on what is needed. And then she just needs someone who can develop a curriculum. I guess there is a certain ability that comes with curriculum development that's needed. So, so uh, if you know someone or if you'd like to, uh, if you have that uh, desire yourself then just contact Prem Kishori and if you're not sure how to reach her, um, I can, somebody, maybe somebody can post her. Uh, Sri Devi, you have her? Uh, email address. Well, maybe Madan Gopal would probably have her email address, right? I also have her email address, Guru Maharaj. I can look it up and post it in a minute. Yeah, we just posted on in the uh, uh, Chandra Mali Swami conference. And then from there, you, people can pick it up on it. And spread the word. Uh, and then uh, just contact her and she'll uh, She'll be grateful. She's doing okay. amazing preaching to tens and thousands of people in India through Zoom. And now she needs uh, to develop the next level of her presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for the information. So, devotees, uh, please, um, Shitevi Mataji can, yeah, you'll be sending the address anyway, email address, so devotees can contact her directly. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Guru okay, Maharaj. Okay, uh, Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai. Sambhaveda Bhaktivinda Ki Jai. And we'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Take care. Thank you. Hare Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare the master cook, Nitai. Vidnishringa <laughs> Leela. Thank you for smiling. <laughs> okay.